Sí, entonces, sí, la idea es invitarles a hacer las preguntas en el momento en que las tengan, ¿no? Que no se las guarden para el final, sino... Sí, 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 sí. Vale, perfecto. A ver si conseguimos la participación. Y si la de la semana que viene, que también es cara vida, pues si tienen alguna pregunta de su parte, la podrán hacer entonces. Perfecto. Y también anunciarles lo que viene eh, la, en la siguiente sesión, que sería la sesión de mañana, eso creo que también va a ser sí. importante. Y ahorita ya estás, ya estás live, porque creo que aplastaste el botón de Start Broadcasting, entonces ya estás live, nos están escuchando y te están viendo. Entonces, si quieres, ya puedes... Eh, vale, vale, perfecto. Eh, ahí estamos, perfecto. Entonces, bueno, puedes empezar cuando quieras. Adelante. Perfecto. Uh, hello all, uh, this is Marina Roche uh, from Itlas Viriada. Uh, I, I am project manager in the virtual development team and in this session I will go in to provide you some training on the traction requirements to size the battery. So this training is a part of a four uh, training program four days training program. Yesterday you had the first session in, uh, by Vidak Sabria, also from Iriada, and this session was, the target was to set the vehicle target. So in that session you were inspired by various cases and you were able to understand how the business model affects the use case definition and that, uh, that also applies in the private. So usually The target setting is very specific for the for the vehicle purpose. In this session, we will take that, that target and uh, follow all the equations and all the calculations that we have to follow to size the battery power. So mainly in these two sessions, two and three, we will size the battery power and the battery capacity. Usually we think about capacity, but power is also a very important characteristic of the battery because sometimes it is even more limiting than capacity, uh, depending on the case. So today we will focus on the power and tomorrow we will focus on the capacity. Uh, so th this is a the three day training program and next week we will have an additional uh, session that will be a follow up session. For this session, we ask you in the different presentations to do some work and we will also uh, send you some uh, a template to perform these, these activities so that it is easier for you to follow all the steps. And the purpose of this last session is that you have the ability or you have the possibility to, to, ask, your, to ask further questions that you have during the, the process uh, of creating these uh, calculations. And, and, and also, if you, if you can, to show your presentations from your specific startup. We would be very happy to, to attend to your to your presentation. So that would be your time to your time to present. So getting in on size thing two, first uh, I will be will give a brief introduction of what my team uh, does in visual simulation, so you can understand a little bit better the background we have, and that permits us to to create this training. Okay, this is the, the index, we will see, see it later. Uh, okay, so, it, okay, ah, sorry. Okay, so in, in general terms, in, in Iriada, it's an engineering company in worldwide, and we can provide the service for the vehicle development in all the steps from benchmarking, and so testing or tear down of the competitors, also virtual development with simulation and functional development of all the subsystems to make sure they work with each other, and then laboratory testing of all the components and the complete vehicle. So finally, we have the final vehicle and we can also perform homologation in this company. So we can give you support from many points of view. In this case, I am from the virtual development team. So our characteristics is, is that we have uh, people from many different uh, calculation specialities, and we are very active in innovation, creating new capabilities, 
And one of our biggest assets, I would say, in comparison with other cases, is that our company has a lot of testing facilities. So we have a lot of input, a lot of data from which we can learn to make the proper assumptions or know what is important and, then, and to provide uh, tips uh, when doing the calculations. So in this training, we will both present you the equations for the sizing and complement the equations with the tips, because usually the more difficult part is to know how to make the proper assumptions or how to measure some parameter. Okay, so I hope it is useful. Uh, the different levels of uh, simulation, so there will be a concept simulation that it is more simple, that represents how uh, each component interacts with the other to give the global uh, vehicle performance. Then uh, we have the detailed design that can be 3D models or, or CFD models. And then we can integrate on these systems in a very complex simulation with all the systems integrated. And finally, these models are usually also used for semi-physical validation. So cases in which maybe the motor is tested in a test bench, but there is software uh, emulating the demands of the motor driving wherever, in a mountain or, or some places. Okay? Uh, today, we will only focus on this type of concept simulation because what we want is a very concept uh, calculation to define the, the targets. Uh, of course, maybe some of you, if you are very experts in simulation, may think that it is quite simplified, but, but um, we have to apply the adequate complexity to the adequate step of the, of the process. So probably for this step, this uh, complexity is, is enough. So a little bit what I want to say uh, is that this type of uh, concept simulations, sorry, because this is a This type of concept simulations represent the interaction of all the different subsystems, as you see here, and the transmission, the battery, the motor, the clutches, to calculate their impact on the total energy efficiency and performance. So they are not very detailed. Not, we don't have detailed model of the motor or the transmission, but we can see the interactions. So the important is to apply the sufficient fidelity for the application. No more, because if we put more, we are spending too much time and we will have a lot of difficulties to estimate the parameters of the equations, and that will be an additional problem. And of course, no less, because if you, if it is, if we forego important assumptions, maybe we don't reach to the correct results. So it is a balance of, of complexity. And we can fill these models with the specifications of the components or with test data. So a little bit, the, the process, so what we want to do is to make decisions at this same level. So, you have the vehicle performance targets, for example, speed, range, the carry load that you want to carry, acceleration time, weight you want to climb, so that it is the vehicle level targets, and we will make a, a model or a calculation model of the vehicle, uh, considering the power to subsistence, the, the vehicle, the controls, and with this, we, it will permit us to take decisions of uh, for example, what has to be the weight, what has to be the runner resistance, what has to be the motor power, what has to be the battery power, the battery capacity. So this is the first step from the vehicle performance to the system specifications. Uh, the typical flow is that once you have the component specifications, you go to the market, seek for components that have that specifications, and usually you find components with higher specifications or maybe slightly lower, that might be enough. So the common uh, process is then to do the process back in the reverse way. So we model these components that we find in the market and then we calculate what would be the, the result. And maybe there is a component that uh, it is very close to the, our specification but does not reach it. And then we calculate the impact in the targets and we can decide if it is acceptable, not. So it is a two-way process from vehicle performance to components. And then we have once we have the components, we can recalculate the result. Okay. 
So this is a little bit our background, what the what our team does, and as you see, it is very fitted to I think the, the purpose of this of this training. So with our background on on many projects, with a lot of effort, we prepare this this training that I, I hope it will be useful for you. And also, I encourage you that if you have any questions in any time of the training, you can write it down. Uh, don't wait to the, the end, and we will answer the, the questions when we when we receive them. So I encourage, or, or at the end, I, I encourage you to, to write up the questions because the purpose of this training is that it is useful for, for your case. I also want to highlight that we are more experienced in, in passenger cars, trucks, buses, so quadricycles, so we are more experienced in more heavy vehicles, from quadricycles to, to cars, uh, trucks, and we have a more limited experience in, in, in bikes, scooters, but the process is the same, so we try to uh, adapt it to, to the case. I think here in the audience we have uh, startups working with um, scooters, bikes, quadricycles and also I think minibuses. So I, uh, we try to adapt uh, what we know to, to all the cases, but yes, keep that in mind that maybe uh, the direct experience is a little bit more limited with these small mobility devices. Okay, so the training to estimate the power of the battery is divided in four main uh, parts. First is to estimate the vehicle running resistance. This is the resistance to advance, to, to, to move forward. Uh, then to set the traction requirements. So from previous training, we had the targets. Now we are going to put numbers to it and we are going to calculate the force we need to comply with that target. Then the second and the third step would be uh, uh, once we have this target force, uh, calculate also the, the power, so define the, the force and the power that we need at wheel level to comply with the targets. So to this point, we are talking about vehicle level and performances at the wheel. And then the final step would be to take this data, this target that we have to, in the wheel and move them to the battery. So if we have a target power at the wheel, of course, that will uh, imply a target power in the battery. So that's what we will do in the fourth step. So mostly the definition of the battery power is very linked to what happens at vehicle level and what are the targets at vehicle level. That's why you will find so many references to the vehicle in this training and maybe not so much to the, to the battery technology because the battery technology is already covered in, in other trainings, specific trainings. And finally, there is just one slide compiling all the, all the references that we used in the training and a handout work for you that we really encourage to, to do. Maybe you already did for your vehicles. If not, we encourage you to do because it is very useful to understand the relationships, what is important, what is the effect of the power. So I, I think it will, it will be interesting if you can comply with this step-by-step -step work. Okay. So we dive into the vehicle running resistance estimation. Okay, okay. So uh, what is the running resistance? Uh, you see here a vehicle climbing a slope. So of course, you can imagine that the weight drags the vehicle back. Uh, the, the, the weight, um, so the vehicle has a resistance, it has to uh, overcome to climb this slope and it is a force that it has to overcome. So there are other resistances that also limit the vehicle going forward as the slope. The slope is the more easy one to identify because we even can identify it when we walk over a slope, but there are others, resistance, that limit the, the vehicle going forward as well. So we have the force of the aerodynamics, so we have, we are surrounded by air, this air has a density, so as we advance, we have to make space in the air that it is in front of, of us to, to go forward. 
so that the vehicle, so that vehicle that it is going forward needs to make space here or make a space in the air so that it is the, res the resistance of the air to make that space is the resistance of the aerodynamic. Then uh, we also have the uh, resistance that the, the tires deformate and generate a resistance that we also have to, to overcome to, to move forward. Okay. So we talked about aerodynamic and rolling resistance, but these are not the only one uh, contributions to, to resistance. We have more contributions. Uh, one of it is the wheel half, so it is like the axis over which the tire slips. So it also creates a small uh, drag by by rotating. And we also have the brake pad, so the brake pad um, touch the brake disc, disc when when you need to brake. But when you are not braking, they are so 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 close that they sometimes touch a little bit the the brake disc and also create some resistance due to that, some friction. And also the drive time friction. So all other parts that rotate, um, gears or the motor, that those have friction that we also have to overcome to uh, forward. And uh, there are ways to do a specific testing to evaluate the overall vehicle running resistance or also the individual parts running resistance. Usually for simulation the total is enough because we can use the total and calculate the impact. So when it is useful to split in the different contributions, when we want to improve, if we see that our vehicle has a very high running resistance and we want to improve, we don't know which part they improve. So we can test each of them separately see which is the bad one or the one that will be more cost efficient to improve and, and improve that one. Uh, Ideala is of course very really experienced in the in the testing approach. So um, I, I will explain a little bit the, the testing process for this. And in case that you cannot perform running resistance testing, I have three, four slides with some tips to help you estimate these run resistance forces uh, on your own with mathematical formulas and so on. Okay, so I will share the video because I think this video is quite interesting. It is a short video in which, um, okay, yeah, it is working in what uh, what we can see is how it is uh, measured okay and this will and this way it will also help you to understand how you should estimate it if you cannot perform these these measurements so for the total vehicle we accelerate the, the vehicle in a flat path and then we measure how it decelerates we let, let it um, decelerate in, in neutral gear and we measure the deceleration times. Uh, from that, we get the, the force, let me say, the force that drags the vehicle back in, in this deceleration. That's the 100% of all the resistance, okay? So then, how you can estimate the resistance of the rest of components? Uh, okay, so next step, if we want to split, we put it in a device that it is a roller that moves the tires. Uh, we measure the resistance. So here we measure the resistance without the aerodynamic because the vehicle is stopped and we can see the, differ the differences. And then we here we make more tests removing parts. So maybe we remove the drive shaft and we test again. So the difference is the drive shaft drag. Then we remove the brakes and test again. So the difference is the brakes bra. And then, and then in an elevator, we move the wheel. And this way, we know the drag of just the tire half. So there are many splits. Um, OK, the tire can also be measured in a brake drum and a specific device to measure the tires 
And if you want to measure the aerodynamic, you can go to an aerodynamic uh, wheel tandem. This is usually quite expensive and can be avoided if you do the other steps. You can just estimate the aerodynamics from the other steps. So from this, you calculate the resistance. Here you see the resistance at different, uh, at different speeds. Right, sorry. Here you can see the, as you see, velocity and force. So at each uh, velocity, we have different resistance that it is usually higher with the, with the speed. And you can also see here that even though we have very precise devices, we test it different times and each time we obtain different results. So it is very normal to obtain slightly different results. That's why usually when you make a measurement, you have to make it five times, ten times to have some representativeness and seek for the average. You can you should not do it just one time and take that value. So also consider that when doing your estimations. Okay. And yeah, here are some examples of the, the, the different uh, loads. And so here. Yeah, so here is the total load, and here are some curves for the different distributions. And finally, all this data um, can be used for simulation. This is a very, very important input for simulation. Uh, this is mostly important to calculate the maximum speed and the, um, and the range, the, the energy consumption. It is not so much important for acceleration, but as we use it, it all, in all the performances, that is why I put this part, the first part of the of the training. So mostly important for max speed and range, but it influences all. Okay, so this is the um, testing approach. And why do we put so much interest, so much effort on this uh, running resistance? So here you can see more or less uh, how the energy is split in an electric vehicle the length of, or the size of each flows of course depends on the application the quality the efficiency of the motors it depends on the case but it is a, i do think this is a good reference so we recharge the vehicle with energy from the grid so we consume this energy for the grid from the grid and part of it does not even reach the battery because it is lost in charger losses so this is at the end this part is the total uh, um, uh, sorry pleasure pointer i think would be better this is the total uh, energy that we have stored in the battery to use when we move what happens that electric vehicles also regenerate so all this energy that we regenerate is additional uh, electric energy that we can use to move so here you have the regeneration so to move we can use what we got back from the grid and also this extra that we got thanks to regeneration so this is the total that we have available to move forward Okay, so from this total, this is a part that there is a part, a small part that it is lost in battery internal resistance, and then there is also a part that it is used to non traction consumers. These consumers are usually small in normal vehicles, but in special conditions, they can be very high. So, which are these special conditions? For example, um, if you have comfort functions, so HVAC, air condition, heating inside the vehicle, and then you are using those, this consumption goes quite big. If it is a cargo vehicle in which the um, cargo is also refrigerated, this consumption is also quite big. But usually, if there is just the vehicle and in the easy use and nothing more, this consumption is quite small. So most of the rest of the energy goes to the motor or motors. So this motor and inverter and drive drain have some efficiency losses, some conversion losses, that it is energy that is lost. And the, the big part of it, it's energy that we can actually use for traction to move the vehicle forward. This is energy that reaches the wheel. So 
from this energy that reaches the wheel, what do we use it for? Uh, we use it to mostly to overcome running resistance. Here we represent the drag of the tires, wheel half, and so on. So mostly tire drag here. And here we have the IO drag, the drag due to aerodynamics. So more or less, depends on the case, the use case, the wood, two thirds of the total traction at least go to drugs. So that's why it is very important to identify the amount of these drugs. And then the other more or less one third goes to inertia, goes to accelerate the vehicle because we start with the vehicle stop and we accelerate to some speed. And the energy we have accumulated in inertia is the kinetic energy, that it is one half of mass speed squared. So we have some energy here, and the beauty part, so all the energy that we use for power drain losses is lost. The energy we use to for rolling resistance is lost. The energy we use for aero is lost. But the beauty part of the inertia, it is energy that it is not lost, it is stored in the form of kinetic energy. So we change energy that was stored in the shape of chemical energy in the battery to energy that it is stored in the shape of kinetic energy on the vehicle. And what happens? When we decelerate, uh, we have to remove that energy for, from the vehicle to reduce the speed. So when we decelerate, there is also running resistance. So there is also aero, there is also wheel uh, running resistance, tire running resistance. So this part of the running, running resistance, let's say it is for free because we cover it with the energy that we have stored in inertia. So this is also running resistance. And what happens to the other? If we don't have a regenerative brake, for example, in a combustion vehicle, we have to press the brake and lose all the energy that will become losses. But if we have a regeneration brake, like in an electric vehicle, we can brake with the motor, applying a negative torque. And this small part that we recover, it is injected back to the battery and it is the regeneration that you see here. So the, the energy goes from battery to inertia. We store it in the shape of inertia for some time. And then when we break, we got it back to the battery to use it again. And just keep in mind that even in electric vehicles, we use a little bit the hydraulic brake. Okay, so now you see why running resistance is so important. Because uh, for what reaches the tire, almost all of it, let's say all of it is used for running resistance. So running resistance makes you need more energy for traction but running resistance also makes you regenerate less because you can just regenerate the excedent. So if running resistance was very big, you have very few left to break with the motor brake and to your regenerate. And the others, for example, power drain losses are proportional to the traction you need. So are proportional to the running resistance. So at the end, all the consumption and that you need is mostly linked to the running resistance. That's why it is very important to estimate it and everyone is making big efforts to, to reduce these, these factors in the, in the vehicles that we find in the market. Because it is usually a cost-efficient way to increase the range and reduce the costs. Okay, so we move to the next slide. The best way, and of course the, the way they are as encouraged to, to, to follow, is to follow the, the regulation. It depends on the country. Uh, for example, in, in Europe, we use uh, the WLTP regulation that we say here. In other countries, there will be other regulations or adaptation of these regulations. And what this regulation does is it accelerates the vehicle to maximum to 120 kilometers per hour or to maximum speed, and then it decelerates. And it calculates the acceleration, uh, so it, it calculates how fast it decelerates. So if it decelerates very fast, is that it has a lot of resistance. If it decelerates very low, very slowly, it has few resistance. And this type of measurement is very, very, very extremely sensitive. 
to the road slope and uh, to the weather, to the wind speed. So the regulation also considers correction formulas for the wind speed of that day, uh, the ambient temperature and the road uh, slope. Uh, in our case, we measure with an almost flat slope, 0.03% slope. But even though this slope has effects on the results that need to be corrected. And at the end, what we obtain from this procedure is a curve like this. This curve is for a passenger car, but the curve will have the same shape for any vehicle. So it, at zero, it uh, crosses at a certain value. This is the value that we have at all the vehicle speeds, that it's mostly due to the tire. So all the time, we will have at least this drag, this one, and all the additional drags that increase with uh, the square of the speed are mostly due to the aerodynamics. So the aerodynamics, the faster that we go, the, first, the more volume of air we have to move, and the higher the resistance. So it is a formula that it is um, calculated like this. Uh, F0, that it is a constant, plus F1 per B, the speed, plus F2 per B squared. So all the purpose of all the testing and all the assumptions we will uh, discuss in the following slide is to calculate F0, F1, F2. With these three coefficients, we can calculate the resistance force. Also, in the regulation, they perform all of the, this correction, but at the end, they end up calculating F2, F1, F, F, F0, F1, F2. The corrections, what they do is to apply some corrections to what was measured, but this is the, the final result of the regulation. So what uh, can you do if you cannot follow this approach? There are different approaches that you can follow. You can choose to follow one of these or two of them and balance which ones do you prefer to take or as you prefer. So first, uh, here is a, a formula based on vehicle parameters that it is uh, described on this uh, regulation. Uh, the risk is that this regulation is not so obvious to bicycles and scooters, so it is uh, mostly for passenger cars. I don't know if also quadricycles, I'm not sure if also quadricycles are included in this regulation or follow a different one. So maybe it is. it does not work so good with small mass vehicles. But anyway, it's a quite simple formula. You can try it and compare with the other methods. This is why you will have a reference. So uh, mostly uh, when we calculate, when we don't test, we will forget about F1, because F1 we can identify it in the test, but all the estimation methods mostly target to identify where the curve crosses here, that would be F0, and, and how it increases with the square of the speed that is F2. So from now on, we will almost forget about F1. It, it, if you don't have F1, it will just happen that it will have a little bit higher F0 and F2, but at the end, all together will represent the same drop. So let's say F1 is a very experimental value, and you can only retrieve it when you do it experimentally. When you do it theoretically, we we'll focus just on, on these ones, and you see that also the regulation does the same. Okay, so we forget about F1. Um, okay, to calculate these resistance forces, we consider F0 as 0 0.14 of the test mass. The test mass is the mass of the vehicle uh, that, uh, in the condition that you want to calculate the resistance. So maybe your vehicle weights, I don't know, 10 kilos because it's, it, it is a big bicycle, but if the driver weighs 70 kilos and it is a cargo bike and you want to have a cargo of 30 kilos, that is the total mass you have to consider because the bike on their own 
not to go anywhere. So uh, yeah, you have to consider here the real mass of the vehicle when you are going to use it and when you want to calculate the the the, the vehicle and the driver and the car when you want to calculate these resistances. And then, then for F2, they propose this uh, equation that considers the test mass and also the surface of the vehicle. So this other coefficient per the width of the vehicle and the and the height, because the bigger is the frontal area of the vehicle, the more um, air we have to move to move forward. Okay, this is one method. Uh, the other method is uh, to identify it based on the main parameters that contribute to this resistance that are the rolling resistance and the aerodynamic drag. We saw in the video that also the drivetrain drag, the wheel hub, the brake pads, that there are other things that affect it, but the big, big part are these two ones. And these are the ones that we will tell you how to calculate them with the formulas. So for the F0, we have the mass per the gravity per a coefficient that it is uh, related to the tire uh, characteristic per cos alpha. Uh, cos and alpha, alpha is the slope of the road. So if we are calculating in a flat road, it will be zero, but the angle will be zero and the cosine will be one. So cos alpha is no longer needed. And then for the F2, it is uh, one half of the density of the air. Uh, usually we take the density and reference conditions between 20 and 25, but if your case is very special, if the temperature is extremely high or extremely low, you can recalculate the, the density of the air. Per the um, aerodynamic coefficient, so how aerodynamic is the, the vehicle? So it is, well, we will see it in the next slide per the frontal area, and then we have the square speed here in the formula. So how to, what are the difficult parts here? I would say the difficult parts are FR, CX, and the frontal area, because the other ones, the mass, the gravity, are very accessible uh, metrics to calculate. Okay, so we will dive in the rolling resistance coefficient of the tire. So, why the tires have resistance to move forward? Uh, the tires, we think they are completely round, but as we put a lot of weight over them, they have small deformation. Okay, so as we move forward, so when the tire is rotating, we deformate the part that it is in contact to the with the ground and if it the, now this part of the tire is deformated and if it moves a little bit forward this part will be deformated then this one so changing the part it deformates makes the vehicle put some pressure work to the tire to make that deformation and that is energy that it is lost and we reduces the amount of energy we have to move forward, they are still part of the, this energy. So there is a coefficient to calculate how big is this uh, resistance. So here you have the, the formula, so the vehicle mass, the gravity, the cosine of slope that in flat condition is one, and then the running resistance coefficient, it is usually between 0 0.005, 0 0.007, so something like that. Uh, how to estimate better this, this coefficient? If you are working with water cycles or heavier vehicles, there is a regulation that indeed was updated a few uh, recently, that it is a tire labeling. So the tire levels, the tire has various levels. The one that we are interested in is the efficiency level. Then it has another level of how good it breaks in rainy conditions and then we have other level of how much noise does it uh, produce when you drive. So we are mostly interested in, in this one, okay? 
and it is the regulation that regulates this. And at least uh, at Europe, it depends on the on the country. But if you purchase a tire, it is not compulsory because it is um, certifications that suppliers can choose to give or not to give. So a supplier can choose not to give this certification but usually they, they do. So you can check the category of the tire you are purchasing and see in these tables that I extracted from the regulation the, the roller resistance. So if you have a category C vehicle, the tire, uh, your rolling resistance will be between these two factors. Okay. Uh, usually there is no, or at least in Europe, it is not possible to sell tires with a rolling resistance factor higher than 11. Um, so even though the tire is very bad, it should not be higher than 11. You see here, these numbers are bigger than these ones that I proposed, but here, so to use them in the formula, you have to divide by 100. So here it is nine. So if you want to use it in the formula, you have to put 0 0.0.09 because the units are Newton per kilonewton and you have to convert it in Newton per Newton to use it in the formula. And you see here that there are three columns of tires. So this one is the one that would apply to quadricycles or passenger vehicles and these other two apply to more heavy vehicles like trucks, buses, depending on the case, it would be one or the other. You can check in the regulation uh, to which category does your vehicle apply. But in general lines, you can see that the heavier the vehicle, the more restrictive is the labeling because you see the formula, the resistance is proportional to this coefficient, but also the mass. So with heavier vehicles, the regulation is more strict and on these values to, to reduce the total the total rack. So here a class B can be achieved with 7.7 .7 for a passenger car and for a heavy truck it requires a five. So it is important not only to check the level but also to identify to which vehicle category that is your is your vehicle. Okay, so all of this regarding to to vehicles. If we move to bicycles or other type of um, small mobility vehicles, it is much more unregulated and unregulated. It is difficult to, to find a, a value. Uh, however, we dived in a little bit in the internet and found this interesting article that proposes uh, and values for different uh, conditions. And indeed, they made measurements. So I think you can use the results of that um, article as a reference. And also they measure different wheel diameters, different uh, rounds, so this is also very interesting. I have to highlight that all the regulation specifies the rolling resistance in a special testing device that it is made of metal. And not in the roads. So these values are quite representative or more or less the same of the resistance find on the roads, on asphalt roads. Not exactly the same, but, but very similar. So here is for asphalt. I guess that most of the vehicles that you will develop, quadricycles, minibuses, the target is that they go on asphalt roads. If not, Please let me know and uh, we can help you identify the resistance in other types of roads. Because as you see, uh, you will see with bikes, it multiplies even per 10 the amount of running resistance, for example, if you are driving in, in sand. So just keep in mind that for quadricycles and buses and so on, these coefficients are only valid for a spot. Uh, for tight bikes, I think it is more likely to go in other kinds of surface. So here in the article, you can see the coefficients for the different surfaces. Okay, and then we move to the other part of the equation to estimate it mathematically. 
and F2 is one half of the density of the air per aerodynamic coefficient per the area. So the density of the air is this at 20 degrees. If you if your use case will mainly happen in other temperatures, I encourage you to recalculate it to your temperature. Then the CX aerodynamic coefficient depends on the shape of the frontal part of the vehicle. So how much resistance do we put to it? So here with these pictures, it's very easy to see that the, and we also see it in bike competitions. So depending on the position you have, you are more aerodynamic or, or less, and that is a, a coefficient. So uh, for the case of quadricycles, maybe you have the coefficient for your vehicle. Otherwise, uh, this coefficient uh, for commercial vehicles, vehicles that are produced in the mass market, it is usually published on the internet. So you should find a vehicle that it is very similar to yours in the purpose, in the shapes, and um, check uh, on the internet what is the coefficient, and you can use it to estimate that of yours. Um, also, if there is no specific development to have a very good CX in your vehicles, maybe you should increase that value a little bit from the one you find on the market vehicles. But uh, internet or your benchmark vehicles, it's a good starting point for for power cycles, buses, and so on. So uh, for bikes, uh, there is also few documentation because it, it is more unregulated. But we also found an interesting article that I sent here, in which they provide the value of CX per A, so the two together, the two coefficients together, depending mostly on the position that the driver is driving. So you can see it ranges from 0 0.37 to 0 0.5. The, depending on the, the style at which you uh, write. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is represented by these curves. And the other curves represent the additional drag you need if there is a slope. And that we will see in future slides. Okay. And for the other vehicles, quadricycles and buses. The difficult part is to estimate the frontal area. So, if you take a picture of the vehicle from the front, it would be the surface that it is solid. So, the main body of the vehicle plus the tires plus the mirrors. So, there are numerical CAE and CFD tools to calculate this more accurately. But if you don't have the opportunity to do that, at least you should make a rough visual estimation of what would be this equivalent frontal area. And if you don't, uh, so that you can make it with a picture and measure in the area, or, um, so, so for example, you put a picture, you put a one meter inside, in front of the picture, and then with the computer, you calculate the total area that it is covered by material. And otherwise, if you cannot, you can also calculate, this is a rough approximation width, the total width, per the total height, width considering the mirrors, and height considering the, 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 the tires, per 0.8. This is also an estimation you can use. Okay. So um, now, to, to this point, we saw two analytical methods, two mathematical methods. One is just to follow the equations of the regulation. Other is to estimate the parameters uh, your, yourself and calculate it. I think it would be interesting to do both because with the regulations, you can also verify if you are too far to, if you made some error in the formula because it is easy to make some error and that you can validate with the regulation. So take the regulation as a reference. And now we will tell about maybe some more experimental uh, approach. So the experimental approach would be to emulate what the regulation does, to accelerate the vehicle 
to a certain speed and let it decelerate in, in neutral in an almost flat speed. Uh, speed. The flat is the best. So then at each speed you measure, you can apply this equation. The resistance is the mass per the acceleration that you measure. So you calculate the acceleration at 20. For example, you divide it by the mass, and that's the force at that condition. Same at 60. So you do it at different points, and then you get the, this curve. Uh, what happens that mostly all the roads that you have access in, even though they seem to be flat, they are not flat, as flat as it is needed for this test. And this is the effect of testing in not flat roads, that when you drive uphill, the resistance is higher, and when you drive downhill, it is lower. So it is important to, to do the test in both directions, one in one direction, other in the other direction, if you can repeat it five times better, and then make the curve for each test that you have, and then make the average of all the curves. So once you have these 20 tested a lot of times, you make the average. And that's why you cancel out the effect of the slope. And what happens if your vehicle has no neutral? Because that's the problem of most electric vehicles. You cannot put them in neutral. Maybe you can test with an equivalent uh, combustion vehicle that it is representative of your case to, to test it. Or if you are with a bicycle, with a bicycle that has no uh, traction, no electric traction. And if not, if you're, you can only do it with your vehicle that it is electric and you cannot decouple the motor, you have to measure the, the electric uh, consumption and remove it to the power from the power because the inertia of the vehicle deceleration thing is part used to cover the force resistance and part used to cover that electric energy the remaining energy that you will measure in the motors so if you go for this you also have to to consider that electric power that the motors are regenerating and, and correct it Okay, and finally, I think uh, you sometimes saw in the formulas that I put M, M sub K instead of uh, M in the mass. What is sub K? It, it is that when we accelerate, not only the vehicle accelerates, all the rotating parts also accelerate. Also, they increase the rotational speed and they move. So here we have a picture of a vehicle driving and you can see in the picture that the wheels are moving are rotating of course so the wheels have also some inertia energy stored in the rotation and then the same happens for the transmission for the motor in everything that rotates in, inside the vehicle okay so there are many formulas regarding the energy stored in this type of devices but at the end it, in practice, it is like we have more mass than the mass that the vehicle really has. When we accelerate, we have to accelerate the vehicle mass plus the equivalent mass of all these rotating parts that we also have to accelerate. And there are formulas for this that I will not see today. Uh, for electric vehicles, you can estimate that this equivalent mass is more or less 5% of the mass of the empty vehicle and that would be enough but it is nice to consider because it is five percent more mass it is not it, yeah it, it's a factor that it is better if you if you consider because at the end it's five percent so to this it was a little bit long uh, it is the end of the part of vehicle running resistance estimation i know it was long but it is a key part for all this training and for the next training. So that's why I want to highlight it so much. And now I would like you to participate in the training. So if you have some questions, write them down. And uh, I would be interested if you already estimated the run resistance of your vehicle to also write it down. Like, okay, I'm whatever startup from this country, we estimated with the empirical method done by ourselves. 
or we estimate it by the mathematical formula. I think it is also interesting to know what you do and also to be, that would be a reference for the rest of the startups that are facing this, this problem. Okay, so then we move to the next part, the construction requirements uh, calculation. Uh, okay, in this part, in the previous part, we calculated this curve. If we are in a graph of force versus speed, we calculated this work. The force that we have to make to move the vehicle and at that speed. Okay, that's the F rest, F resistance that depends on the velocity. So it's F0 plus F1 per V plus F2 per, plus F2 per uh, V square. Okay, but sometimes we also accelerate and sometimes there are also slopes. So when we accelerate, the mass is mk, so the equivalent uh, inertia mass per the acceleration. And when there is a slope, we also have to consider the mass per the slope, per the, per, per the mass per the um, gravity, per the scene of the angle of the slope. So the higher the slope, the higher the, the force needed to climb the slope. And which mass do you will consider here? So for acceleration, we will consider the mass of the empty vehicle plus the mass of the driver, because it is also adding weight, plus the mass of the cargo, if there is cargo, plus the equivalent mass of the rotating parts. That's 5% of the empty mass. Because when we accelerate, we increase the vehicle speed, but we also increase the speed of all the parts that rotate. Okay, But for the slope, we don't consider the equivalent rotating um, parts mass, because the, those parts are not affected by the slope. They don't rotate faster or slower depending on the slope. They rotate faster or slower depending on the vehicle speed. Okay, So if we apply this formula, what happens? Uh, I think you can play around, you can take this formula and play around with different values. You can make this graph for different speeds and then add what happens if you add one meter per square second or minus one meter per square second slow, uh, acceleration or 10% slope or minus 10% slope. What happens if you add that? So if you add positive acceleration or positive slope, you will get a parallel line of resistance uh, over the, the one that you calculated before for the resistance. And if the acceleration is negative or the slope is negative, you will have a parallel line but lower. And you see here that, that when we are decelerating or, or downhill, sometimes this force is negative. And what happens when it is negative? that all this part that it is negative, it is the extra energy that we can regenerate with the electric motor and put it back to the battery. So it is not, it is good that it, is, it crosses the negative uh, axis. And what we said before, why it is important to have lower running resistance? Because if this curve is lower, you will be in the negative part sooner and you will regenerate more. So this is more or less the curve you can make. Okay. And play a little bit with it. Okay. Okay, so now we we'll get back and we take the work that you did after the previous session that was for target setting. So you should have set the targets of the route and the targets of maximum speed, maximum acceleration, uh, maximum weight. And we will dip in a little bit more on the targets. So, what is maximum speed? So by this is the maximum speed that your vehicle will comply. Sometimes, and mostly for small mobility vehicles, it is not a matter of the vehicle not having more capability, it's a matter of the regulation not permitting you to go to higher speed. Also, to fulfill the Target speed, we should consider that there is usually small slopes on the roads, there is also usually wind. 
So we should check that it covers the max speed in flat conditions, but we usually also check that it covers the max speed at 2% rate, more or less, so that we have that extra capability <laughs> in case there is small wind or small snow to cover that speed. Acceleration, the time you need to go from stop to whatever speed, 200 km per hour, to 30 km per hour, to 10 km per hour, you have to think of your use case and define the targets of acceleration you think they are useful for your use case. And now we go to the gradeability targets, the ability to climb slopes, and you see that there are three different ones. Okay, one, the first one that I will describe is the sustained gradeability. So this is the case that, for example, your vehicle is driving at 30 kilometers per hour, and then it faces a slope. And we want it to continue climbing that slope at the same speed it was before. And maybe it's a mountain road, and it is a constant 5% slope for a very, very long time, maybe half an hour driving that uh, constant slope. So that would be the slope that we want the vehicle to be able to sustain, for very long periods and it faces with previous speed. Max gradeability. This is very similar to the other one, but it is very extreme cases. So imagine you have a garage with a ramp of 25%. So and the vehicle has to fulfill that target. Of course, you have to size the vehicle to be able to climb 25%. But it is impossible in, that in the world there is a slope of 25% and five kilometers long. Usually these type of slopes are very short, like 80 meters or even 10 meters. So are very short slopes in garages and very exceptions, okay? So that's why we differentiate both of them, because in the first one, we ask the vehicle to sustain this slope for a very long time. And in the second, we say, okay, you have to climb it, but if you can climb it for 20 meters, that it is enough, because we know that there is no very long slopes <laughs> of this uh, type. And then we have the startability. The startability is the capability to start on a slope. So you are stopped, and you have to start and start moving. So what happens? You have to overcome the slope resistance, but you also have to accelerate the vehicle because if you have enough force to climb the slope, but you have no remaining force to accelerate, you will remain at zero kilometers per hour all the time. So we want to move maybe from zero to five kilometers per hour and continue climbing the slope. So this is more demanding because in the equation we have to consider the losses, the, the, the resistance of the slope and the resistance of the acceleration. You can consider different levels, but usually 0 0.5 meters per square second acceleration is good, uh, a good reference. If your vehicle does not comply, maybe you can lower it to 0 0.3 meters per square second or, or so on but never zero, because if it is zero, you will remain stop at the same speed all the time. That, that's zero, that's what you don't want. Then uh, there is the load, so if the, your vehicle is uh, focused on carrying goods, you have to consider it and specify what is the mass of the goods you want to carry, and also calculate the demand uh, considering that load. And then the range the amount of kilometers you want to drive and you can calculate it with the population cycles or as we propose with your own cycles with the cycles that are from the from your real use case that would be the better and then i want you to consider the combined targets usually this is a very global idea of the targets of the, or the maximum targets but it is very common to find combined targets. So, and it is very important that the vehicle complies with them. So for example, as I said, I wanted to reach max speed, but I want also that the vehicle can complete with max speed at a 2% rate. So this is a combined target. We have speed and we have rate. 
Or for example, you can say, yeah, but I also want the vehicle to comply with the max speed, a 2% rate, and with 100 kilos or cargo of cargo. So that would be another target. Okay. And usually these combined targets are reduced. For example, you can say, okay, I want my vehicle to climb 20% slope because that is the slope that we find in, in the garage, in the parking. But we also want to be able to climb 80% slope at 80 kilometers per hour. So imagine you have a vehicle that can reach 150 kilometers per hour and that can comply with this 20% slope at very small speed, uh, five kilometers per hour. So we can put a target in the middle. Okay, okay. if you go to a mountain road that in our country, you can check the routes that your vehicle will do. We can expect an 8% on average. I expect my vehicle to fulfill this case at 80 kilometers per hour. You can see, okay, it's not needed to do that slope at 150, but I want to do it faster than five. So this is a combined target in which we put the, a medium slope with a medium speed, and we want it to comply with both two. So those uh, combined targets are also very important. So here are some examples, and you can also combine them with the payload and, and so on. So, um, okay. So I want you also to write on the chat if you already work in the vehicle targets and in the combined uh, targets, or if you will start working on that after this uh, training. I think that will be an interesting feedback. And also, if you have some questions, yes, just let us know. So more or less from what Didac said, um, and I said, you can build, and this is part of the handout work, a table of all the targets that you have, and what is the target that you ask in that situation for each of the parameters. Slope, mass, load mass, speed, and acceleration. So for example, you can put a target that it is 2% slope, zero load mass and maximum speed of your vehicle, I don't know, 80 kilometers per hour, and zero acceleration, steady speed. So this could be one target. Other target, short slope, 20% uh, slope, that's the parking uh, slope, uh, maximum mass, 100 kilos mass, because we want to plan the slope fully loaded, in this case, usually you don't climb a parking slope very fast. Usually five kilometers per hour would be more than enough. And stop. Because we consider that the vehicle already has a speed, already is at five kilometers per hour, and then it climbs the slope. And then you can put another target, for example, that it is to climb this short stop slow but accelerating so you were stopped in the slope and you also want to accelerate so maybe you say okay if, if i want to start in the slope the slope would be 18 for example instead of 20 and then i would accelerate at 0.3 so to complete all this target with all the cases that you think are reasonable for your vehicle, not only the extreme ones that are mostly the ones that you use in propaganda, also for combinations of them, because these combinations are also what determines that the vehicle is useful. Maybe you can make a marketing of very high maximum speed, but then the vehicle drives at 20 kilometers per hour in rural roads, between the mountain roads, so then that vehicle will not be useful for the mountain. So th these combined targets are also important to so think about them for your specific use case. Okay, and then the second part of this handout is to calculate the force unit for each of the targets. So you have the formula that we said before, the resistance force that is proportional to the speed, the acceleration force, and the slope force. So you have here all the data 
you need to apply this uh, equation. So you can apply the equation and put here the number you obtain for the force of each of the targets. This would be the second uh, handout. Okay. So after you make this handout, you can make a plot like this one or similar of force versus velocity. And here uh, you see each of the targets where it lies. So usually the targets that require a lot of force we require small speed. And on the other hand, the ones that require high speed require low force because this is the maximum speed uh, case. So this is also a, a plot that we would like you to do from the result of the previous uh, chart. Okay, and this is very helpful to visualize the different targets, which one is more demanding, and, and so on. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, the the area, so you can see estimate an area that we have to cover. That is this. This is an example of another vehicle. You can also see the area that we have to cover. So this is the area that we have to cover with the motor requirements, with the motor power and with the battery power. So th that's why we are making these plots, because we are going to draw an area and convert that area in the target for the motor and the battery. OK? OK, so that's the tractional requirement definitions. Uh, we ended with this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of plot. That's the requirements. And now uh, we are going to define the tractive force and power that we need at will. So we are going to draw the area that we will cover with our components. This is the task of the next, next section. OK. Uh, so here it is interesting to see uh, we are not focused in motors in this training, but it is important to know a little bit about motors because it will imply the sizing of the battery. So it is interesting to know the differences between the combustion motors engines and the electric motors. Usually this is a typical combustion engine uh, shape and this is a typical electric motor shape that it is specifically optimized and developed for automotive applications. So uh, electric motors have this constant, usually this constant torque region. And then this region that is curvy, that is defined by a constant power region. So torque is power divided by speed. So that's why if you see it in a torque, it is curvy. So this is uh, the constant power region. So what usually happens in this type of motors that having this constant power region permits to go to higher speeds and higher torques than the combustion engine. So here you see this engine has the same power, but just has this power at one point. And the electric motor can sustain the power in a lot of points. OK, that is why usually the requirements that we saw in the previous slides like this have this kind of shape, the shape that the e-motors have. So to cover this shape with a combustion engine, we have to put a lot of years, the first year, the second year, the third year. Now there are vehicles up to nine years, uh, passenger cars with up to nine years. But with electric motors, we don't need it to do it anymore because the motor has a wider operation area. And you can see that with this one motor, we can cover the area that was covered before with an engine with a lot of uh, gears. So this is a very important characteristic of the motor. And that's why there is an, a factor, an equation that determines that. That's the maximum RPM divided by the RPM at which we can offer the maximum torque. In this case, maximum RPM is 10,000, and we can apply the maximum torque till more or less 3,000. So the characteristic of this motor is 3.33. 
the bigger the characteristic of the motor, the better, because bigger characteristic would be a motor, for example, like this, that would be even better, that would cover a wider area. But also, the wider it is, the more difficult of is to find this technology and the most more optimized it needs to be to, to automotive. And you see, if we calculate the same for the engine, the engine, this factor is one, more or less. So the, here is the, the, one of the advantages of electric motors. And the bigger this figure is, the more adapted this motor is for automotive use, and the less <laughs> you would depend on, on years and so on. So what is the optimal? to find motors with this factor higher than two that covers all our needs. What happens? For small mobility devices, usually it's common to not find um, this type of motors specifically optimized for automotive. I, I, probably the market will adapt and in the future there will be more options because this problem also happened with cars 10 years ago. Now we see this type of motors, but 10 years ago it was more difficult. So probably the market will, will evolve with time. But today, probably mostly in small mobility, you will find motors of this type that are square, that if you divide maximum RPMs per RPM at which you can sustain the maximum torque, the, the, the big division is one, and is more or less as the combustion engine. So how to cover this area? You can put a huge motor that covers all the area. And what is the problem? That you are overpowering the motor. You have a motor that provides all this power, and all this power is not really needed for your application. So it is a little bit oversized. And the other option is to use one motor like that and to put gears. And there are electric applications with gears as, as well as then the, the, the internal combustion vehicles. So you can solve it by putting a smaller motor and put different gears as the as the as in the combustion engine case. So that, that those two would be suboptimal solutions if what you have is a motor of this type of characteristic but at the end would solve the would solve the problem for you. Okay. So here uh, we made some calculations of motors that have different characteristics, characteristic number six, characteristic number five, three, and two. We did not plot the one, but you can imagine that it is like this. So the beauty of, of all these curves is that all of them, it, it, they were calculated for a vehicle, and all of them permitted to have the same acceleration times from 0 to 100. So you see that number 6 has high torque at the beginning, and then it has lower torque because it has lower power. And then you can see that number 2 has lower torque, and then compensates with higher torque because it has higher power. So the two of them take the same time to accelerate from 0 to 100. What does this mean? That the power you require at the wheel depends on the type of motor you choose. And the power you need at the wheel <laughs> implies the power you need at the battery. So that's why we are speaking about the motor's characteristics. OK, so how to calculate the power that you need at the wheel? I will speed up a little bit because it's this quite late. I, I didn't expect the training to be so long. Um, there are ways to simulate it, but uh, we made our research and I think this is the more best trade-off of for, for your case. So this is a simplified formula to calculate the time it takes to accelerate from zero to the speed you need. And what the formula does is like to calculate the integral area between the maximum motor torque and the resistance forces, because all the difference is the force you use to accelerate. So the formula would be the mass mk divided by two times the target time you want to accelerate. So it's something you want to accelerate in five seconds, so five. And then multiply by the final speed you want to achieve at the square 
and then the base speed squared. Base speed would be the point at which the shape of the motor changes. So in this motor is this point, in your case would be the point that you identify. And you calculate it by the maximum speed of the vehicle divided by the, the x characteristic. If the base speed is higher than the B final, you put B final here. But if it is smaller, like in this case, you put the, the speed, the, the speed you calculate. So from this, you get the power you need to reach that acceleration. Okay, so now we define the battery target power. So we have all the points. So we want to cover all these traction points. We can make this line. So we want the motor to have this force. We also want the motor to provide this speed at the wheel to cover this maximum speed. And from the previous formula, we calculated a uh, power. So T equal P uh, power divided by speed, we can build this curve. So this is the area we want to cover with the E motor at wheel. I also encourage you to, to, to make this, this graph uh, to, to, to put all the information together. So which problems you can face uh, when doing this? Imagine that you calculate this curve for the power acceleration, and you see that some of your target points are outside of this curve. It means that with that power, you will not cover these points. So you will need to increase the power. So in this case, what will determine your power requirement will not be the acceleration, it will be the grade. It can also happen. So if that happens to you, you have to increase the power. Second problem, if you have a motor of characteristic x equal one, okay? The motor that covers the acceleration is not enough to cover the traction requirements. You calculate the motor. Imagine you want to accelerate from zero to 80 in whatever time. And this is the result, this power, this is 80, and if you do the square motor, if x is equal to 1, you get this shape. But this shape is not covering all these other requirements that we want to cover. So, or you change motor uh, to one of a different characteristic, of, or you put gears, or you oversize the motor. So, if you oversize the motor, you will have to purchase the x equal 1 motor that covers all your area, that it is this. So as I mentioned, X equal one motor usually oversize the motors. So you will have to purchase this motor. Of course, more speed and more torque equals more power. The motor will have more power than the one that you strictly need. But you know that this power is not needed. So maybe you can purchase a motor of this power, but you don't need to purchase a battery of this power. You can still size the battery with the target power that you calculated for acceleration. You can size this, the, the battery with this power. And this should be the one that you consider for the battery. So what happens? That you will have a motor that can deliver very high power, but you will not be able to do that because the battery cannot deliver that high power. But at least you will only oversize the motor. You will not oversize the motor and also oversize the battery. So that would be the, the solution for, for this case. Okay. <laughs> um, Maria Rosa, do you think, uh, well, I think we have some few more slides. I, we, we will end at uh, half and we, have, we will have short time for questions, but if you want to have questions after the time ends, or at the beginning of the, of the class tomorrow, we will also have the, the opportunity. Okay. So here I want to highlight also the difference between continuous and peak performance. Continuous power can be maintained for long periods. For example, you can climb an 80% slope for long periods, but peak power is only available for short periods. You can climb 20% slope for short slopes. So the same happens for motors and for batteries. 
there is a torque and a power that it's called continuous, so you can use them for long times at that condition. And then there is another characteristic that it is called peak, that you can deliver this peak uh, capability for 10 seconds, 60 seconds, but not for hours. So this peak is enough to cover short slopes, accelerations, because usually accelerations are very fast. So you have to make this difference to cover the short target demands with the peak condition and the ones that can go for a long period with the continuous condition, because the continuous condition is the power that the motor of the battery do not overheat. If you work in the peak condition for a long time, they would overheat. So now we get back to the graph we did before. And uh, what we draw before was the peak demand. And now I want you to consider what would be the continuous demand for the motor. So for this, maybe you did not consider in your target list before this type of cases like, I want me to climb 80% slope for very long routes. So if you don't consider, please put them because this is usually the ones that determine which is your continuous uh, condition. Also, you want to cover the max speed for a long period. So this is what determines the con continuous condition. Usually condition, uh, this condition is half or two thirds of the peak uh, condition. Okay. okay, so we have both the peak and the continuous condition. And now we have to move finally to the topic of the training that was the battery power. So we have the willpower. If we, we finally, after all this work, have the willpower. If we divide it by the transmission power, we have the motor power. So it is quite easy calculation. You can consider an estimated uh, transmission efficiency between 90 and 95%. And then the formula was moved, but the power of the battery is the power of the motor divided by the motor and inverter efficiency that we can consider 80-85% plus the consumption of all the additional consumers. So BCUs, screens, and that kind of thing that usually the consumption is very small. But also if your vehicle has comfort, or cooling of the cargo, these are important powers. So if you have important powers of these additional consumers, you should consider it. Okay. So with this uh, simple equation, uh, P will uh, divided by motor and transmission efficiency. So we move from the power at will to the power that we need at the battery. And we need to do it two times one for the peak and one for the condition, so continuous. Just one special uh, point. If you are you are, have electric bikes, don't forget to subtract what the person, the rider, is doing. So usually for recreational riders that are not extremely fit, and uh, they do 100, 200 watts of of power. So you subtract this from the power at the wheel because this is free, this is what the rider gives to us, and this way you can consider the calculate the power of the battery. Okay, um, here are some hints to work because usually the batteries, some of them specify the power, but other ones specify the C rate being one, two, and their C rate specify how much time does the battery take to completely deplete. So one C means that the battery depletes in in one hour. Two Cs that it depletes in 0 0.5 hours. So it links capacity with power. Uh, so okay, so to con calculate if you have if the C rate, you just have to do capacity of the battery multiplied per C rate. This is the peak, the, the power that you will obtain of that battery. And here I put you a website with where they have characteristic of cells from 
many different suppliers. So you can have a look around of different technologies and maybe this gives you the ideas of typical values or even possible suppliers for you. And final recommendation, verify with your benchmarking vehicles because we make so many assumptions, so many formulas, so many targets that it is useful, possible that you were mistaken in some formula or overestimated one factor or were very strict in one target and you oversize the results. So it is useful to compare your result with that of the competitors and if it, if it is different, analyze whether it is correct because maybe your use case is different and it is correct that it is different or whether you have to review some of your targets or the calculations. If you compare, you will not find the power of the battery, but you will find the power of the motor. So you, what you have to compare is the power of the motor that you calculated. And that's all for the training. I'm sorry for taking uh, so long, but I think it will be useful for this, all this explanation. Here are the, um, the references. And then the handout work, this is more or less a, a summary of what we mentioned during the training to do. And we will send you a empty PowerPoint with the templates we recommend you to, to fill for the, for the handout work. Because I think it, is, it will be a very useful exercise in, in your vehicles, even though the vehicles are already built to, to go through, through this exercise. So thank you for the attention. And I don't know if you have time to stay for some questions. In, in my case, I have time. I don't know the others. Marina, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear uh, you. I, yeah, perfect. Uh, I posted in the chat that if the audience has questions, uh, they can leave it in the question chat. And mm -hmm. you can address them tomorrow morning. Okay. Uh, tomorrow in, the session, in the session of tomorrow, I mean, yeah. Okay. But I don't see any any questions so far. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't see questions either. Okay. So, uh, okay, we will see then uh, tomorrow. I will be giving the second part of the training. Today we size the power, and in the next part of the training we will size the capacity. And probably it is too much information in, in one day, but that's why we have the follow-up session also one week from, from now. So if you have problems during the handout uh, work or after reviewing the documentation, you can also let us know uh, in the next uh, training session, in, in the, in the follow-up session next week. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Marina. Uh, and we'll see all everyone tomorrow, right? Okay. See you, everyone, tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.